Take your Bibles, if you would, and let's look at Luke chapter 12. Luke's gospel, as you know, is where we have been in this great, wonderful book, and uh, it is about to crank up, as always is the case when we approach these new sections that Jesus begins to teach. We come to the subject this morning, and likely next week, the subject of worry. The subject of worry. 500 years ago, Michael de Montaigne said this, My life has been filled with terrible misfortune, most of which never happened. End quote. There was an interesting study done not too long ago where the participants were asked to write down their worries over an extended period of time and then identify which of their imagined misfortunes actually happened. Results were, of course, as you would imagine, fairly straightforward. Roughly 85% of what subjects worried about never happened. And according to the study, with the 15% of things that did happen, 79% of the subjects discovered either that they could handle the difficulty better than expected, or the difficulty taught them a lesson worth learning. So the study concluded that Somewhere around 97% of what you worry over is not much more than a fearful mind punishing you with exaggerations and misperceptions. Last year, I wanted, to, I wanted to look at something more recent. So last year, Harvard Medical School studied the correlation between anxiety and physical illness. First, they defined anxiety. They said it's an everyday emotion and it is related to the fight or flight response, or so secularists sort of imagine it. They said it can be a good thing, prompting us to take extra precautions. We would agree with that. When you're concerned about something, you might beef up precautions for whatever it is you're about to face. But the study concluded, when anxiety persists in the absence of a need to fight or flee, it can, they say, undermine our physical health. Evidence, of course, suggested that people with unwarranted anxiety are at greater risk for developing a number of chronic medical conditions. And then the study went on to look at anxiety from a purely biological standpoint, saying that it is a physiological reaction to stress or pressure or how you process stress or pressure. The study said that the sensation of anxiety is thought to arise in a particular portion of the brain that governs these intense emotional responses. And from a purely biological standpoint, they describe it this way. As neurotransmitters carry the impulse to the nervous system, heart and breathing rates increase, muscles tense, and blood flow is diverted from the abdominal, abdominal organs to the brain. In the short term, Anxiety prepares us to confront a crisis by putting the body on alert, but its physical effects can be counterproductive. And they found in the study that there could be lightheadedness, nausea, severe digestive issues. They went on to talk about anxiety in this particular study as an illness. There's growing evidence, they said, of mutual influence between emotions and physical functioning. In other words, what people who worry... Uh, have in common is unwarranted fear or distress that interferes with daily life. The chart that they showed had all kinds of different forms of anxiety, which I won't belabor, but their most general definition basically said this, exaggerated worries about health and safety and money and other aspects of daily life that last six months or more was going to be accompanied, they said, according to their study, by muscle pain, fatigue, headaches, nausea, breathlessness, and insomnia. Worry, of course, has been long since linked with ulcers, with gastrointestinal issues, and chronic respiratory issues, according to the Harvard Medical Study. They even went on to say it contributes to heart disease. That's the secularist opinion. That's the study from the scientific standpoint with regard to physiology. Jesus dealt with the issue with these words in Matthew 6, 34. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day, he said, has enough trouble of its own. As Jerry Bridges said in his book, Respectable Sins, Worry has, been, has become one of them. 
Not referring, of course, to adrenaline rushes or imminent dangers in that fight or flight reaction. There are things that incite fear in us as we begin to realize them and the brain goes on alert and the thoughts conclude things and convictions come about. Your body responds. We're not necessarily talking about those kinds of things that bring about these sensations of anxiety. Legitimate concerns that we deal with. However, legitimate concerns that we might deal with can even themselves move into some sinful fear and begin to devastate your spiritual life, as the text before us is going to illustrate. The Bible warns us about anxiety and sinful fears. The Bible indicates that these things will cripple your practical life. They will debilitate your spiritual life. Worry itself, just just the reality of those sensations can be troubling because it can sap your strength. Relationships can become very high maintenance, constantly stirring up controversy. People who are anxious tend to want to cover every liability in their fears. They tend to want to answer every question and have nothing in their life that will risk anything. They penetrate every issue to make sure they cover every scenario. Comfort in life becomes their highest goal. Pain-free living, no conflict. They consume relationships, and they try to manipulate circumstances and relationships in order to gain such security. Well, last time we looked at the beginnings of this problem in Luke 12, and what we studied last time was the twin of worry. Did you know that worry has a twin? And we studied it already. Jesus introduced us to anxiety's twin last week. What is that twin? It is simply this, coveting. Coveting, an inordinate desire for something, an out-of-control desire, a ruling motive. That's why Jesus begins to talk about coveting in 13 to 21 and then goes right on into a discussion about worry. Because what we covet will drive what we fret over. You don't believe me? Look at verse 22. And he said to his disciples, by the way, the same conversation, the same discussion. So right there on the heels of talking about the foolishness of storing up treasure on earth rather than being rich toward God, Jesus says to his disciples, verse 22, for this reason, I say to you, don't worry about your life. For what reason? Back to verse 21, so is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. There it is. If you lay up treasure for yourself, as the greedy man did in the previous discussion, then you will not have stored up richness toward God, and therefore you are coveting. If you covet, you're going to worry. Both are sins. Laying up treasure for yourself rather than making eternal treasure the ultimate prize and goal toward which your entire life moves will destroy. It will cause your perspective to become skewed with regard to what is truly valuable, what really matters. We saw last time that we ought to be not rich in the things of this life. They may come, they may go. We may have them, we may not. But we are to be rich toward God. What does that mean? Rich in faith rich in humility, rich in good works, holiness, conformity to Christ. Those are our riches. And we saw that because back in verse 15, we were taught by Jesus that security in things is an illusion. Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. In fact, verse 16 to 20, you remember, said that a soul cannot be satisfied with earthly treasures. It's foolish. It won't satisfy. And since life is a vapor and then comes judgment, it would be tragic, utterly tragic for your mind to lock in on something that cannot satisfy and could blind you to something that's coming, which is eternal. What you own, therefore, soon owns you. And so Jesus gives a command here on the heels of a discussion about coveting. So what is it you covet? What is it you want most? Security, comfort? You want no trouble? You want no pain? You want no difficulties? You want all the money that you need anytime you need it? You want all the meals on the table as lavish as you want them? 
You want your bank account stockpiled? You want your material goods full on and mapped out for the years? You want your portfolio to be full and the graphs as colorful as you want them? Big slices of the pie? If you covet those things, on the back side of that is a major problem with this sin Jesus now begins to address. Worry. For this reason I say to you, he says, do not worry about your life as to what you're going to eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. You can have those things. You can go to the store and buy those things. You can set up a bank account that takes care of those things. You can get a job and get a paycheck that that makes a trade on the open market for those things. You can do all of that, but you're not to worry about them. The word translated worry here is in its most basic form, and even in this context, essentially means to be overly concerned about it. Or as one uh, pastor in the 19th century put it, to be uneasy in your mind or your spirit about it. To be uneasy in mind or spirit. Overly concerned. Upended would be a good term. Disturbed. By the way, this is the same word that we saw back in chapter 10, verse 41, when Jesus was trying to deal with the different approach to his presence between Mary and Martha. Same word when Jesus says, Martha, you are, there's the word, disturbed. You are distracted. You are overly concerned. You're anxious. You're upended. You're all in an uproar about so many things. In that text, the two words are put together, the word for disturbed and worry. Those are synonymic in that passage. If you're anxious, you're disturbed. If you're disturbed, you're anxious. If you're unsettled in spirit, there's worry going on there, or at least the potential of it and the precipice right in front of you. Take no anxious thought for your food or your clothing. No anxious thought. And so having now said that the the ultimate overarching reason is that it's greed that drives it, so you should be warned that worry has some sort of covetousness behind it, some sort of ruling motive behind it. I mean, I think that's a great diagnosis right up front. If you have worry in your life, don't necessarily go forward yet to see what reasons there are for not worrying. Actually, look behind you and see where there has been coveting. What do you covet? What do you long for inordinately? What is it you desire in such a way that has overruled your life? Things you can't control, things you don't have, things you'd like to have, or even trusting in the things that you do have and are afraid that someone's going to take them. And so you hoard and protect. There's some kind of desire that has either been neutral at first and has become rampant and ruled your life, or it is an evil desire You believing that you're sovereign, you believing that you have to secure your own life, this is what is behind this discussion. And now, having said, for the very reason that you want to avoid greed, I don't want you to worry about these things, Jesus now gives two more reasons. And these are very blunt and convicting We'll try to cover this ground this morning if we can, and if we, if we can't, uh, because we would be going too quickly over it, we will tie it off next week. He gives two more reasons and explains them thoroughly. And we find it beginning in verse 23. Notice what Jesus says, "'For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing.'" Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn. That's familiar language from the parable he had just told about the rich man. The ravens don't have a storeroom nor a barn, and yet God feeds them how much more valuable you are than the birds. Then he says, And which of you by worrying can add a single hour to his lifespan? If then you can't do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. But I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. 
But if God has so clothed the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you? And here it is, you men of little faith. You men of little faith. So by observation then, there is a direct connection and correlation between worry and the lack of faith. So in this section, 23 to 28, Jesus gives us the first reason that we should not worry about such things because, frankly, it is unbelief. It is unbelief. There is another reason why you shouldn't worry. And I like this because it is very straightforward and it doesn't allow us any wiggle room with our definition. I know sometimes that because worry is is considered a respectable sin, we sort of forget how it became a respectable sin. Worry became a respectable sin because we stopped defining it as unbelief. We stopped saying what my wife said this morning, it is high treason against God. We stopped defining it like that. We call it um, care and concern. We call it stewardship, don't we? Well, I have to be a good steward. We call it, well, there's so much stress in my life. If I could just get the stress down. We stopped calling it what Jesus illustrates here. It is a result of small faith. It is unbelief. In what form, you say? Well, let's just look at this. The first form of unbelief here, it would would be properly stated this way. I have to look out for my daily needs. That would be the first expression of the unbelief Jesus is telling us that we ought to get rid of here. I have to look out for my own daily needs. Look at verse 23. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. And then he talks about the ravens. So life, he says, does not consist in food and clothing. So if you are bent on believing that you have to look out for your own daily needs as one of God's children, you are ultimately seeking security in yourself. What do you find your ultimate security in? Just ask the question and ponder it. Or maybe we could ask it this way. What makes you breathe a sigh of relief each day? Paychecks are nice, but what happens to my faith when my groceries and my wardrobe are not all that I'd counted on for that sense of well-being? What happens when the resources are not all that I would like for that level of comfort? 1 Timothy 6.8, Paul was content with food and clothing whenever he joined them, and he told the church, hey, be content with food and clothing when when you have those. Be content. Don't be asking for more than that. Don't get all bound up in imagining that you need more than what God already knows you need. But there were also many times when Paul rejoiced in the severely limited amounts of both of those things. Philippians 4.12, he said, there were times when I was in complete want of those things. He'd spent nights in the ocean having been left for dead. He'd been beaten many times. Uh, there There was no meal being served to him. There were times when he had no resources. They'd been taken away from him or or he'd been given maybe less than the very basics for health in a prison cell. And he says, I've learned to be content in either state. So what about us? What happens when life isn't yielding the things we like to have? And what happens when it's not yielding those things in the amount we've come to desire inordinately, in the amounts that we believe we need them rather than what God gives? If I have a bent on enjoying certain sensations of security to my desired level of comfort, and I take that as a prayer item before God. What happens when it isn't answered the way that I enjoy? What happens to my faith? Do I assume that I can just change my circumstances by my own power, and then somehow I've meaningfully altered the core of my existence? 
People do that. We try to solve our worry, solve our fears, and solve our problems by manipulating people and circumstances and manipulating our perspective, looking to earthly things and counting that as some sort of substance. And then when we have changed our circumstances, we sigh and we feel relief and we think that somehow we have changed the course of the core meaningfulness of our life. Jesus is saying right here, that that would be a foolish perspective, an unbelieving perspective, because life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Life, by the way, here is the word for soul. So Jesus is saying all that concerns the soul does not consist in food and clothing. Existence for the human being is not meaningful because we are able to sustain life with food and secure our future with money enough to always protect ourselves from exposure. That's not what makes life meaningful. Meaningful living comes from being conformed to the image of Christ in God. Meaningful living is looking to God. Meaningful life is trusting the creator of the universe who bought you, purchased you, and takes care of you. But we often drift into this kind of unbelief that says, I have to take care of my own needs. Listen, if you have two competing allegiances in your heart, one whereby with your mouth and maybe a few things you say to God, I trust you, and another allegiance that competes with it strongly, powerfully, sometimes bullying the other allegiance, and you saying, I must take care of number one. If you're there and you spend your emotional and mental and physical energies counting on such things, Jesus says, you've missed it. It's unbelief. You've not believed what God says about these things. And so right out of the gate here, Jesus says, look, you Coveting is and greed in your heart for whatever it is you're after that you don't have, that is behind worry and anxiety. And, of course, in the culture to which Jesus was speaking these things, coming by a meal every day was tough business. And in the impoverished world under the Roman Empire, there were, there were huge gaps between the rank and file and those that had the supply. And so people really, this would have hit home to them. And in that environment, not the rich, lavish environment like we have, despite the fact that some of us struggle for daily things, but in that environment, Jesus says the same thing. You should not be coveting, and that should should not be a, a pattern of worry in your life about food and clothing. You worry about those things, you are actually imagining that changing your life circumstances is what life and meaning subsists in. That's a mistake. What are you consumed with? In fact, Jesus goes on to say that your value system could be skewed here. It's a question of what you're consumed with, which is driven by this value system you live by. Notice what he says. Consider, ponder, as an illustration, a lesson, the ravens. Now, this is a type of bird that obviously does nothing for itself. It just goes out and it it does no work. It doesn't get involved in preparing anything for itself. That is the point of the analogy. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, and they have no storeroom nor barn. So he picks up that parabolic language from before, and yet God feeds them. We're driven by a particular value system, what we think God values, what we think about whether or not we're left there alone, whether we have to meet our own needs or whether God will meet them. And it's a question of whether you think God lies about these things. That's really what it comes down to. When you worry, you are saying that God does not supply and you have to get involved. It is that blunt. We call God a liar. And it's a question of whether we truly think our sense of security is ultimately bound up in changing our circumstances, temporal fulfillments, earthly provisions. I have to look out for my own daily needs. That unbelief then has a second element to it, and that is I'm not that valuable to God. 
Verse 24, Jesus says, consider these ravens, for God feeds them. They don't sow nor reap. They don't, they don't have a storeroom in a barn. They're not doing any of this work that God calls God's people to do on earth, to work and to eat the fruit of it and to be good stewards. But ravens don't do that, and God feeds them. The Old Testament was, was consistent in its message that God takes care of all of these things in his creation. We saw that when he had spoken about this before, about the sparrows hopping on the ground. Jesus was making the similar point. But notice the end of verse 24, how much more, that phrase is repeated twice in this entire section, how much more, he gives that same analogy or a similar analogy with regard to the lilies, verse 27, and then says how much more, verse 28. Same thing. It's the argument from the lesser to the greater. Look, the raven is the lesser thing. God feeds it, and it doesn't do anything for it. Are you not more valuable, was the way Jesus originally said it. Here, he says how much more valuable you are than the birds. The kind of unbelief we're talking about in worry is to say to God, I have, two, I have to have two allegiances. I know you take care of me, but it's not enough. I have to take care of myself. And the second part of this unbelief is I'm not all that valuable to you. Or you'd give me these things when I want them to the level that would secure my heart. You'd give them. I must not be that valuable. That's the math we do in our minds. It's the math of unbelief, faithlessness. So on a, on a little more practical level, think of it this way. To, to worry about your survival and your security, it means some things in your life that are devastating to your spiritual walk. To worry about survival and security is, first of all, to declare that God doesn't care about us any more than he cares about the animals. You're either on par with the plant and animal life or you're even below them. Romans 8 says that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Look, God loves his people. Why in the world, if he gave his son, would he spare anything else from us or keep anything else back from us? But we, in our worry about survival and security, are declaring that God doesn't care. Love it, own it. Worry is not a respectable sin. It is, it is high treason. Furthermore, to worry about our survival and security is to declare that a living soul, a living soul, is no more precious than plants and animals which have no soul. That is what we are declaring back to God. I know you made us living beings. I know we have reason. I know we have we can contemplate our own existence. I know we are self-conscious. Plants and animals aren't self-conscious. They can't reason their existence out. That is the difference, you understand. And Psalm 8 indicates that, that mankind, though God should take no thought of him, has made him the crown of creation. In his image, animals are not created in the image of God. Man is created in the image of God. We reason. We we can even communicate to one another certain perfections of God, even though imperfectly. We can be like God in that way. We can be compassionate and loving and merciful, and we can enjoy rich relationship. We even have emotions as God expresses those things from his own character. We can contemplate our existence. God knows about his existence. We can reason. He reasons. We are like him in that sense. And so we're a living soul, completely unique, the crown of his creation, and yet Worry about survival and security is declaring to God that a living soul that he made is no more precious to him than plants and animals which have no soul. So it is to declare to, declare to God that he doesn't care about us personally, which the scriptures say cannot happen because we can't be separated from his love, and it is to declare that a living soul is no more precious than everything else that was created that has no soul and wasn't created in his image. By the way, How can you uphold the eternal value of an unborn human soul, yet turn around and worry that you're no more valuable to God than microorganisms? You see the contradiction. 
We love the sanctity of human life, and we use the living soul and its preciousness to uphold the reality that abortion is murder, and we turn around and deny that truth in worry. And so God says, you'll never see a raven with a sign that says, we'll work for food. (laughs) They don't work for food. He says that. They don't sow, they don't reap, they do none of those things, and they don't store it up in barns. What's the lesson? God feeds them. And if he's willing to feed the birds who know nothing, work for nothing, gather nothing, and store nothing, then how can we spend our time worrying about any of those things knowing that we are of infinite value in God's sight. There's a third aspect to this unbelief. This is all, of course, under the heading that worry is unbelief. There's a third aspect to that unbelief, and that is this. I can preserve my future. (laughs) I can preserve my future. Verse 25, I love this. Which of you, by worrying, can add an hour to his lifespan? The word literally is cubit and uh, 18 inches. So in terms of measure, it just meant the, the least that you could measure something out and increase its dimensions. So really, that is essentially what is being said here. Which of you, by worrying, can add even a single hour, the smallest unit of extension on the dimension of your life. Which of you by worrying can do that? The implication is that you cannot preserve your own future, but that is what worry does. And uh, you know the implication that starts rising up in our minds when it comes to our culture. The scriptures teach that health and uh, working toward nutrition and a medical sort of standard of health. These things are beneficial to a degree. Even bodily exercise, Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, verse 8, has some health benefit. It is limited, but it has some health benefit. In fact, he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, that personal discipline in one's life can lead to moral purity. And so that's a healthy discipline. Beating your passions into submission, living a disciplined life so that nothing gets out there on the loose ends, taking aside every encumbrance, Hebrews 12 says, getting rid of baggage in your life. That could include sort of the disciplined way that you live on a practical level. There's some benefit to those things. But I don't have to tell you that our culture is obsessed. Obsessed. And I don't mean the culture around us. I mean the church culture. We are obsessed with health and fitness and all things organic, and it is distracting at best, not saying it's all evil or that everyone's heart motive is evil and idolatrous, but it is distracting at best, and it is deceptive at worst, because you don't often hear someone say that they're obsessed and then begin to evaluate what the sin is in their heart that has not believed God, that has led to the obsession. Some of you are thinking right now, oh, pastor, I'm just trying to be a good steward of my body and my health. I've heard it. I've heard them all. So that God can use me in a greater way, more faithfully serving him with holy devotion and self-sacrifice. I promise that's really why I do it. Scout's honor. It's never even for a moment about my body image. No, I would never go there. It's never about comparing with other people and the way they look or comparing with the culture and me attaching to body image some sort of attractiveness that will get me the people to look at me so that I have the popularity I need to be secure and the beauty I need to be fulfilled and the person I need who will make me happy. It's not not about all those things, just good stewardship. 
of my muscles. It's never for a moment been about lust for attention, really. It's never been for a moment about worldly standards, comparing yourself with what the world is after. And listen, the world, the world is under their father, the devil. The world is being consumed by such things. That's why our culture is going the way it is. It's not because it's good stewardship or it's healthy. It is morally a degradation. That is why they worship themselves and those things that will give them what they sensually want. Or maybe you have health concerns. Great, health concerns, medical concerns. But again, the church can be obsessed with such things and we can take personal opinions and everything we read on the internet and just spread it all over friends. But it has nothing to do, we, we claim, with any fear of illness. Nothing we... Nothing we fear at all. No, it's not an idolatry over illness or a craving for a more comfortable, pain-free life. It's never been about those things, Pastor, I promise. Really? I wonder. I wonder because if it involves worry, it's already idolatry. Jesus makes it very clear. If you are trying to add comfort obsessively when God hasn't added it. When If you are not believing God and trusting God and leaving those things in the limited level of benefit that they offer, if you are in any way imagining that those things extend your life, you're sadly mistaken. Psalm 139 says, that it is God who has ordained the days that we will live on the earth before there was even one of them. And he didn't just ordain the number of them, he ordained every day of them. And I'm not bothered by the mystery of how he can providentially care for me while I make human free choices. I'm not bothered by the mystery of that. It is still true that he's ordained all my days. And I don't know what tomorrow holds, James 4 says. I don't. I don't. Worrying, Jesus says, ignores reality. Notice, if you can't even do a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? I love that. Worrying ignores reality. I cannot add a single smallest measure, not even an hour. Matthew's recording of this when Jesus preached it was similar language. Which of you, by anxiety or worrying, can add even an hour to your life? You can't. That's why I tell my wife, no more vitamins. (laughs) I know I'm going to get to heaven and find out I could have been there earlier. Truly. (laughs) That'll be a slow burn for some of you, but... (laughs) Jesus' point is so profound here. If you can't add an hour, why do you imagine that by worrying about all these other things, you're changing anything in them? You're affecting anything in them? Beloved, you're not. This is why Jesus keeps making the point over and over again. This is unbelief. It's unbelief. In fact, when he says in verse 27, consider the lilies, notice the emphasis in verses 27 and 28. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Look, they're not worried. But I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. God is concerned with the beauty and the color of your life, the contour of your life, the framework of your life, the usefulness of your life, the dispensing of the display of his glory in your life. He's concerned about that. How do we know? Just look at the lilies. They're here today, gone tomorrow. Notice verse 28. They're alive today, and tomorrow they're thrown into the furnace. And yet he clothes them in such a way that just absolutely surpasses the greatest kingdom and glory, regal glory, on the earth in human history. Solomon, in all his glory, couldn't even bring about through the finest of artisanship that kind of display. And yet if God is concerned about 
the display of himself and through the aesthetic beauty of flowers that are here and gone. Then notice what he says. How much more will he clothe you? What in the world are you worrying about such things for? You say, oh, but it's so nice to have those things secured. Have what secured? All you want, beloved, is what God gives. That's what you want, and you want a heart that is contented with what God gives. Laying something before him in prayer and saying, Lord, could it be that you might allow this? It's fine, but James forewarns that you should not have your own pleasure in mind. You should have his glory in mind. Some of you ask for things, he says, and you don't receive them because you want to spend it solely on you. It's not about God's glory. It's all about your security, all about your comfort, all about the praise, all about your feelings. And James says that's why you don't receive it from God. You lay those things before God and they, they are all about you. All about you. And so Jesus says, how much more? He closed the lilies which aren't eternal. A living soul is eternal. How much more will he give you what you need to have? We won't have time to go there. We'll look at it next time, this second reason. But look at verse 30. When the nations of the world eagerly worry and seek all of these things about eating and what you drink and securing their future. But look at verse 30. Your father, look at how intimate it is. Your father knows that you need these things. Look at verse 32. Don't be afraid, little flock. Your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Look, if you've been given the kingdom, you belong to Christ. Christ belongs to God. All things are yours, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, or 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It all belongs to you. Your father has given you the kingdom. Why would you just Say to him in unbelief, I have to take care of my own needs. I can secure my own future. And I can preserve my life. Why? Because I'm not all that valuable to God. How do I know? Look what he gives me. We are saying that God is stingy when we worry. It's unbelief. You know, it's sad, too, because the world watches us and listens to us. And our unbelieving family members and friends watch us and listen to us. How, what, what kind of percentage of gratitude is there compared with complaint? Saddened by that. I wonder if the gospel would have much bigger impact if Whatever we had, we just knew our God. Our God loves us. He considers us valuable. I wouldn't dare try to control the future because I can't. I can't add a single hour. I'm not going to worry about these other matters. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. I just know this. Whatever you give me, I can learn to be content in that. I will not attach myself to it. I cannot attach myself to it. If I do that, I am saying, God, you are a liar. Worry is unbelief. Sadly, there's one more reason here. We don't have time for it, but I'll tell you what it is. Worry is worldly. Worry is worldliness. It is worldliness, and that is what Jesus addresses in verses 29 to 33. With his final principle in 34, where we're headed next week, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That is the issue. God wants our heart. So how are you doing so far? Oh, we need, we need Christ, don't we? We need his grace. We are a bunch of warriors in this culture. And we must come back to faith. Let's pray. Oh, God, strengthen our faith and help our hearts. This isn't one of those respectable kinds of things we can brush off. This is straight at it. 
Lord, we know what some of those obsessions are about. We've known it. Can't get away from it. How grievous. Thank you for your mercy and your love for a passage like this, your voice straightforward in our hearts and minds, your spirit convicting and leading and encouraging and uplifting. Break us down to build us up. And Lord, for those that don't yet know you, how sad and tragic that they have no power. They must then secure their own future like the Gentile nations who eagerly seek these things. You've called us to seek you and where your power is. And so we need your strength to do that. We Please forgive us for our worry, for the sin of anxiety. Thank you for your patience with us. Thank you that we don't have to walk away utterly devastated without hope, for you have bought us in Christ and we are yours. These are instructions for our hearts. And so... Increase our faith in them, we pray in our Savior's name.